Remembering Axe handles Saturday 60 years later, August 27, 1960, in the former Hemming Park, now known as James Weldon Johnson Park, more than 200 white men attacked. They attacked black teens and young adults of the NAACP Youth Council for trying to integrate lunch counters in segregated downtown Jacksonville. Leaving hundreds injured, bleeding, and traumatized, a senseless attack on innocent people simply because they were black. This Thursday marks the 60th commemoration of that attack, and News for Jack's reporter Janice Harris sat down one-on-one -on -one with some of those then-teenage protesters. Tonight, we hear from Rodney Hurst, the youth president of the NAACP Youth Council and only 16 years old when he was attacked. Rodney Hurst learned about segregation and racism as a child, but a history lesson from his teachers sparked a relentless desire for change when he was just 11 years old. And even 60 years later, Hurst is still educating others about the dangers of racism and the stain it left on Jacksonville in 1960. This is downtown Jacksonville. The streets are filled with people coming and going but it's segregated. At the time, Rodney Hurst was only 16 years old and he became the president of the Youth Council NAACP in Jacksonville. His mission was equality for all and lunch counter integration was one of his goals. All of these stores had the same thing in common. They wanted black folk to come in and spend their money, but only where they wanted us to spend our money. To fight against the insult, August 13, 1960, the NAACP Youth Council begins sit-in demonstrations. This is a map of the stores in downtown Jacksonville in 1960. Cohen Brothers was located where Jacksonville City Hall is now. Woolworth was where the federal courthouse now sits. Crest, Grants, and Walgreens were all on the block of Adams and Main. McCrory's on Hogan and Bay Street as well all segregated. Two weeks that we were sitting in, we never saw police. There was no protect and serve during these sit-in demonstrations. Were you afraid at all? Were you and the other children concerned at all? We called it a healthy fear. And a healthy fear was we knew what the possibilities were. But at the same time, we were still determined, as Mr. Pearson said, to be a part of the solution and not a part of the problem. Then Saturday, August 27th, 1960. The day of the attack with the ax handles, where you were, how your day started. When you woke up that morning, how did that day start? When I woke up that morning, it was just like any other day. I woke up that morning to catch the bus to come downtown to go to Lara Street. Rodney Hurst and other NAACP Youth Council members carried healthy fear in their hearts as they went to W.T. Grant's diner to do a sit-in demonstration. They sat and waited. Within minutes, 200 white men attacked the black children and any other black person in downtown Jacksonville. So as we came out of, out of Grant's, and when it began to focus on you that these were men with weapons and they were using those weapons. They were swinging as we could determine against black folk downtown. No local media or newspaper covered the attack except the Florida Star, a local black newspaper, Life Magazine, and the Pittsburgh Courier, an out-of-state black newspaper. The teens began running for their lives from this area. Not long after, Rodney Hurst would find himself in court. But the charges were dropped. A fake witness was put on the stand who couldn't identify Hurst in court. I'm sitting on the front row. Juvenile judge said, all right, young man, for the record, point out Rodney Hurst. He didn't know me. So, so what did he do? He pointed to someone near the back of the courtroom. Five years before, at age 11, Hurst began the journey for civil rights when his teacher and mentor, Rutledge Pearson, told him powerful words in class. He told us to leave the books at home, and he taught us an inclusive American history, including the salient contributions of blacks who were not given anything but who helped develop this country. After Axe Handle Saturday, the fight for equality continued. Eventually, there was a biracial committee formed to deal with segregation and other racial issues, but it was not supported by the known segregationist, Mayor Hayden Burns. Blacks continued to boycott the downtown segregated businesses. And after months of protesting the lunch counters, they were integrated. Why should everyone know about Axe Handle Saturday? 
But one of the things we do in American history, we ignore and omit things to make it appear as if things were fine. Today, a marker sits in the newly named James Weldon Johnson Park, once known as Confederate Hemming Park, marking the square where the attacks happened. It's a reminder of the senseless act on children that changed so many lives and the history of Jacksonville. Mr. Hearst continues to educate locally and throughout the country about the civil rights movement and specifically Axe Handle Saturday. His book, It Was Never About a Hot Dog and a Coke, is a personal account of the 1960 sit-in.